to arts and culture at the heart of climate action. Thank you for joining us, whether you're in person or online watching. My name is Sharice Johnson, pronouns are she, her. Um, quick visual description, um, I am a fabulous black woman with a big afro and clear spectacles. Uh, <laughs> um, so a little bit about me, I am uh, the policy and advocacy lead at Julie's Bicycle. Um, and I also led the Creative Climate Leadership Program for the last year, along with my colleague, Kiara Badiali, who unfortunately could not be here with us today, in spirit. <laughs> um, so we have a packed agenda for you today. So a few things ahead of time. We're going to have to really stick to time, and that goes for our panelists and also for the rest of you who are here when we go on breaks. We do have two, sh two breaks for you. Uh, so you can get coffee, tea, use the bathroom, stretch, whatever you need to do, just be back in your seat um, so we can start. Um, and uh, with that said, I'm going to introduce you all really quickly to some of the people who made this possible today. Um, we have Diego Galafasi from Lund University. <laughs> We have Jessica Nordstrom Sicker from uh, Sigtuna, I'm not Sigtuna, I'm so sorry, I already messed that up, from uh, the Swedish Postcode Foundation, our funder, so I should have that. <laughs> and then we also have Sophia, lovely Sophia, from Sigtuna, Stiftelsen. Thank you very much. And Julie's Bicycle, we have Alison and, and Cherise here, and Chiara, who uh, should be watching us. Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Diego Galafasi. I'm speaking in the name of uh, Luxus, the Lund University Center for Sustainability Sciences. And I'm a co-host of the Creative Climate Leadership Program, uh, which this event celebrates. The Creative Climate Leadership has been uh, running in uh, several countries. This is the fifth edition. Uh, and over the past two years, we welcomed more than 50 leaders in the creative sector across Scandinavia. Um, to really, these are, are, are folks that are pioneering the, the climate work within institutions, within their practices, and just opening up new horizons within the creative sector. Um, we know from the science of transformations and systemic change that small groups of very committed uh, individuals working across systems are really fundamental to catalyze the types of transformative change that we have ahead of us. So that's for us what creative climate leadership is and we welcome all of you and those watching online to also join this community uh, because we know that there's many, uh, many uh, important work and in, important work happening in that space uh, over and uh, yeah, just super welcome and, and thanks again everybody for making this possible. Hi everyone. Great to see that so many of you here are here today and also that I know that there are quite a few that are watching and taking part of this from a distance, perhaps from different parts of the world. Um, so my name is Jessica nordstrom -Sicker. I work at the Swedish Postcode Foundation and we are a very proud uh, funder and supporter of the Creative Climate Leadership Program. And uh, many of you that are here today are also alumni of the program and I know that you've been taking part of um, a really creative alumni session these past days, which I fortunately weren't able to join, but I've already heard the words, there's been so much going on. And um, this summit will sort of be the grand finale of this uh, alumni session, and also the grand finale of these past two years, sort of the start of this creative climate leadership program in Nordic in the Nordic region. Um, but all of these great ideas and initiatives that have been started will hopefully be growing and spreading and uh, developing for a long time after today. And, um, and the network will hopefully keep growing. And I also hope that this summit will sort of be a kickstart to new initiatives on different levels around the arts and creative sector 
and um, give an inspirational injection to all these initi initiatives that have already been started. So, you're most welcome. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very glad and inspired to, um, to be joining the rest of this afternoon. Thank you. Mm, hello everyone, my name is Sofia Jeijstam and I work with PR and communication here at the Signal Foundation and on behalf of whole Sigtun I would like to welcome you to this uh, afternoon. Some of you have been with us for a few days now and some of you joined in just this afternoon and I saw just recently that there are more than 100 people at the moment following us digitally and I would like all of you to feel just as welcome to this event. Uh, the Sigtuna Foundation uh, started out here in 1917, more than 100 years ago. and. This place was from the very beginning a place with a principal aim to foster a dialogue on human reflection. And art has always been a language that we've helped us very much in this dialogue, helping us to reflect on the challenges in society. And even if time has changed a lot since then, I think that we work in the very same way as we did then. We meet one another in mutual respect, we try to learn from one another. And I really look forward to what this afternoon will bring. So thank you very much for participating this afternoon. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and we're going to get into three magical hours of discussion and uh, performances from um, our CCL alumni and friends. And uh, before that, I just wanted to say, if you have any questions, we, we would encourage questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please do go to slido.com on your phones, and where you'll enter the hashtag, which is behind me, creative climate leadership is how you get in. And then just put your question in there, and then we will hopefully be able to get to it during the discussions. Um, and so why don't we get into our first performance? We have Swedish singer-songwriter Christine Amparo here to join us. This first song is uh, written by me to my father. He, he was a very beautiful, warm, intelligent person. And um, he uh, got sick, uh, so when I was 11 years old, he passed away. But we got uh, a beautiful start in my life. So he showed me all about what love is and kindness and everything that we need. So this song is called Min Lengtan, and it would probably uh, be my journey or my longing, something like that. But I will be singing in Swedish, so you can just relax. Oh, mm -hmm. 
Dan. Oh, avec moi. How do you pronounce your last name? Yeah. Uh, and we will sing a very important song for me. Uh, I wrote it uh, maybe seven years ago when uh, the Swedish uh, government allowed uh, young people to be sent back to war in Sweden. And uh, this is of course, uh, yeah, they broke rules uh, and they, they did, I don't know, I can't understand why, of course. Uh, so I wrote this song to help uh, organization that protested a lot during this time. Uh, and they were called Vi står inte ut, men vi slutar aldrig kämpa. And my song is called uh, I, Jag står inte ut, men jag slutar aldrig kämpa. So, uh, yeah. And it's, uh, in English it would be I can't stand it, but I will never stop fighting. Maybe like that. So, uh, well, I need to stand up to do the song. Oh, mm -hmm. 
and we will meet again in the future, I hope. Thank you so much. Thank you. My goodness, what a start. Amazing. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, my name's Alison Tuchel. I'm the founder of Julie's Bicycle. I'm, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a middle-aged, pushing it woman, um, wearing generally dark clothes with uh, dirty blonde hair. And I wear uh, glasses occasionally, <laughs> like now, <laughs> to read. So, um, the first thing is to thank everybody for being here, and we're gonna crack on with our first panel that is um, really appropriate. It's gonna be a conversation about justice, which I think really fits this moment, having had the first song, which was uh, about love, and the second song, which was about outrage and solidarity. So we're going to start the, the afternoon centering climate justice at the heart of climate action and the heart of our creative response. Um, and just before I start, I'd like to just welcome into the room the empty chair. This is a presence that Judy's Bicycle has at all our events um, and all our occasions. We've had the empty chair throughout our time here. This chair represents the voices of all of those living beings, human and otherwise, who are not or cannot or we will not hear. So we always bring these voices into the room. It's probably the richest, most interesting conversation that we could have. So, but because we can't hear it now, we're, we'll have that there. So I'd like to just welcome the empty chair. It's not that somebody's not turned up. It's actually that the whole thing is over there. So um, I'd just like to welcome to the panel um, this fantastic group of panelists. Um, would you like to come and join me? And we'll introduce you on the on the on the chair. So that we're, obviously we've got so much to to uh, talk about, but we're going to have a very brief introduction from each of the panelists, and then um, hopefully we'll have a chance to hear from you and from people who are online. Um, and before I introduce the more person, um, I'd just like to sort of also centre this moment that we are days away from the next round of global climate talks, the 27th climate talks, taking place in Egypt at uh, COP27. Um, and the other sort of key thing is that what we've seen, for those of you who follow these, these the, the global climate talks are centering more and more as they progress, ideas of justice, care, um, how we compensate for communities who have experienced the most suffering. Um, at the, as a consequence of an extractive, a very extractive and um, colonial mentality that so much of the world is organised around. So again, it's a really appropriate conversation to have now on the eve of uh, these really critical talks um, uh, as, we, as the, the ideas of climate justice and how we really respond to this moment uh, become increasingly part of the talks. So we have a, a really super panel. The first thing to acknowledge is that Orsa Larsen Blind, who has been, she's the um, Vice President of the Sami Council, um, and she has been a very present member of the Creative Climate Leadership Programme. Uh, she's taught, she's inspired us, she's, um, she's been um, on several occasions, she's been with us, accompanying us on our journey, and very sadly today, um, she's unable to be with us, um, but I think she is, she is online, but we're not including her in the panel uh, formally, but we, we, we do thank you um, and know that you're, you're with us in spirit. Um, we also have, um, we have Per Olsen, an Associate Professor at the Stockholm Resilience Centre who have done such pioneering work, um, where he leads the centre's work on transformations for sustainability, so thank you for being here. Um, we have Sharice Johnson, who is um, our climate uh, and justice advocate at Julie's Bicycle, um, and 
um, has also um, done a lot of work in science policy. So she comes with, with all sorts of different uh, inputs. Um, and we also have um, uh, Orda Nielsen from Fridays for Future, who we heard from last night, um, her and her colleagues, some really, really exciting and interesting work that they've been doing. So it's a terrific panel. Um, and with that, Emily is not here. Emily is behind me. Emily, hi. Hi. So Emily is the director of the Lund University Centre for Sustainability Studies, who's been doing some really important interdisciplinary work, um, looking at resilience through poverty, livelihoods in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia and Europe. So a real rooting in, um, in climate justice. Through, through that lens. So I'd just like to start first with very quickly, if we um, kick off, Emily, if you'd like to say a little bit about your work um, before we start the conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for inviting me today and thank you everybody in the audience for being here and fellow panelists, hello. Um, I'm, I'm Emily, um, I'm she, her, and I have brown eyes and brown hair. I'm sitting in Lund right now, so this is a, a picture of what it looks like in, in near the university. So I just, we're going to say a couple of things. Um, just that um, as we kick off towards the COP uh, next week, obviously there's a very big agenda issue around um, what we call loss and damage, which is basically about climate justice and the failures that we're, we're currently experienced to both mitigate climate change and adapt to climate change. So I guess I guess where I situate my work is, is partly within the science, so IPCC Working Group 2, and the findings that we have uh, in this new report, which really point to both the, the kind of disruptions that we already see at 1.1 degrees for many communities around the world, as well as um, understandings of the drivers of injustice, we, we have a better understanding of that, and also where adaptation and mitigation is falling short in relation to this. So I guess the big thing here is that the IPCC really said, you know, we need to take concerted action without further delay, and there's a sort of window of opportunity here which is rapidly closing. And at the same time, as the, the, the sort of technical financial solution on the table, we also need to consider this social justice and equity aspects together with that. Um, I think out of the COP though, which would be interesting to hear from, from others, I'm not so sure whether we're going to make an advance on, on loss and damage or whether we're going to be stuck talking about efficiency, technology transfer and, and I think there are, even the Swedish government is not behind financing for loss and damage. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I have high hopes overall of the COP, but, um, but I'm also, I have my concerns. Where I think maybe this audience is interested in is, is the kinds of transformations that we need to take in the law of arts and the creativity in trying to connect to people, both on an emotional level, uh, also um, being part of a kind of movement, movement of art, and also thinking about what what does the art that's coming out now, what does that reflect about our time? So obviously, over time, art shifts and, and reflects the kind of societal challenges that we experience as well. Um, so I'm really excited about being here today, and I'll stop on, on that note and pass on to you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Emily. Pear. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I'm a, a middle-aged white man, uh, uh, and if others uh, have to describe me as having a, a Belgian nose and uh, small ears, <laughs> sort of starting to get more and more grey here, yeah, and, uh, and I'm referred to as he, him, and um, uh, yeah, so I, I, um, I'm, a, I'm at Stockholm Resilience Center, so I am a, I'm a scientist most of the time, and then, but I also do work with the change makers around the world, and uh, uh, trying to connect the cutting edge science on transformation with the cutting edge transformation in practice. So the thing I want to bring in uh, 
to this conversation today is that a bit of a helicopter view on on uh, on transformation and, and maybe on climate justice and 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 the role of uh, art and, and the creative sectors and uh, because there is a lot of talk about transformation I'm very hopeful about it. that makes me hopeful because um, I've been in this business for uh, 27 years and i never seen such a huge interest in systems thinking and transformation. So that makes me very hopeful because in that uh, I think there is a realization that uh, the systems or that, that we need to achieve very large scale change in a relatively short time period. And, and the second realization is that the systems that we have created for food, for food energy, economy are, are, are producing toxic outcomes in form of injustice, inequality and, and unsustainability. So I think that's, um, um, and we know from history that when we have systems that hasn't delivered on what we think is important, we have changed them. So that also give, gives me hope uh, that we have achieved, historically have achieved quite large scale transformation. So that's, um, there are three things that I want to sort of, um, I hope we can uh, talk about when we talk about um, the role you have and the role we have uh, in transformations. And the first thing is to, to know what we're talking about. So transformation as a, as a specific type of change. And I think it's important, we can get back to that. Um, and it's a different from, from other types of change. The second, the second thing I wanted to, to sort of hope that we can talk about is the role of crisis, because we know that crisis can open up as systems for change and can lower the threshold for large scale change. And, uh, but we're pretty bad at, at navigating crisis for change. Uh, we're good at talking about it as uh, never waste a good crisis and maybe tattoo that on our body and to show how what kind of person we are and how we're thinking but we're pretty in sort of societal level pretty 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 bad at navigating crisis for transformation um, and the, the the last the last uh, point i hope we can talk about is the capacities like what kind of capacities do we need we need to because thinking about navigating crisis and uncertainty where we say that most transformations in the future will be crisis driven if not planned transitions that we can plan sort of in steps it's going to be pretty chaotic so we need new ways of thinking about transformation new ways of thinking about leadership so i hope we can talk about that too i hope so too because every single one of those has got a whole other dimension on justice when you bring justice in as your central yeah. centrifugal force terrific how about you, Aldi? Should we hear from you? Um, hello, uh, I am a white woman uh, with black and red hair and a red jumper. Um, and I am active in Fridays for Future, aka the School Strike for Climate Movement, as well as a project called Climate Live, which uses music and culture in general uh, to mobilise people for like in the climate movement, and I'm also a global development student. Um, and I was, before this panel, I was reflecting a bit upon one of the questions, which was, why is it so important to approach climate from a justice perspective? And at first, I felt like that was obvious, but then when I tried to put it into words, I really struggled, because to me, as a person who is, who is in a grassroots climate movement, it feels obvious because climate justice is all we know, it's the air that we breathe. But then at the same time, I'm very much aware that most people in general society have no idea what the connection between the climate crisis and social justice is because we get taught that the climate crisis is something that has to do with the physics of the atmosphere and polar bears, and we don't understand that it's a crisis that will impact us on all different scales and it will interact with already existing systems of inequality and oppression. And I think that this way that we're viewing the climate crisis really alienates it from real human lives, which makes change impossible because we can't relate to it. 
Um, and this also led me to think about a conversation that's been brought to light a lot, lot recently, um, because Sweden now has a fascist government, and I'm calling it the fascist government because their policies are unequivocally fascist. And um, some people are arguing that the climate movement shouldn't talk about this, we should just keep talking about biodiversity and emissions, but that's not everything the climate crisis is. And I mean, even if it was, it would be incredibly unethical to just watch and let things happen, let people get deported and get, let people be harassed without doing anything. Um, but the climate crisis is inherently inseparable um, from um, anti-fascism because asylum seekers who are struggling to you know, get to stay in their country and working class families who are struggling to ma make ends meet our struggles are one and the same and we are fighting the same evil which is a system that's exploiting the planet and its people and in such a society we need to stand in solidarity with each other um, and that's the only way forward. Thank you. issues that were affecting um, black and Latino communities in the US. So I worked on chemical safety, air pollution, and then even things like endangered species and also gun violence, um, which I think sometimes people don't consider under um, environmental issues. But my thinking is that environment is where you are. Um, and so where, where you live, work, and play is what, is what the environmental justice movement likes to say. Um, and so in doing that, you know, it, it, was, it was personal, um, and there was a lot of anger in that, you know, you have to do something with that anger. And, and so I, um, I just made it my mission to bring that conversation into uh, the spaces where you would usually never see it. So somebody has to do it, right? It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy and it's not fun, but um, talking to people who absolutely do not want to um, change. Um, but uh, yeah, so some, something that we worked on a lot was on, um, like I mentioned, chemical safety. There are a lot of communities in the US, and you might have heard about this, who literally, literally fence line communities to the point where um, one place I, I visited in Houston, Texas, um, there were homes where in their backyards you could actually just put your hand out and you could touch these giant storage containers. Um, they, and you could see the uh, flares from the oil refinery that was right across the street, and um, still nothing was happening. Not for, not because the community wasn't trying, it was because the local elected officials were, you know, in the pockets of oil and gas industry. Um, it's because there was very little political will and because of the way things are um, with uh, zoning laws and that sort of thing, and that is, where justice comes into play. It is not just about the environment. It's not just about climate. It is about all of these things intersecting. So climate justice is one, on one hand, it's, it's this framework under which we um, can work in, in policy and that sort of thing to um, find solutions and, and, and try to get things moving, uh, funding and, and actual building that political will. And, and importantly, it's also a movement a movement of many movements that come together in solidarity who understand that we all, 
we, we will all win if, if, if we can come together and face all of our respective issues that we're facing under the umbrella of social justice, racial justice, disability justice, indigenous rights, just workers' rights. I could keep going, basically, <laughs> but, but I won't. I'll spare you. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me. Thanks. So that's such a great way of basically questioning the idea that the climate crisis is the heart of the problem, that actually the heart of the problem is something else, which is um, how it is a symptom of a deeper malaise which speaks to, pair your point about systems change, to your point, both of your points about intersectionality, and actually which reframes the job of our incredible climate leaders in this room who have been thinking a lot and developing a lot of really exciting and inspirational work around uh, their climate interventions. Um, you often orienting towards justice. So the question is, is the problem climate change or is it actually a problem of justice? Um, and I'd like to start with you, Emily. Um, in a way, at the rock face of um, climate negotiation, where we have uh, a global community that has failed to show up for the 100 billion a year um, promised since 2015 to support global south economies from, uh, from, uh, to develop a more climate resilience. And very interestingly, you say, sadly, I have to say, that you're not optimistic about loss and damage, but you are optimistic about the role of creativity and culture. Can you just explain a little bit more about why you've put your optimism into the hands of this incredible group of creative climate leaders? Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I, maybe I should, should clarify that my, um, my so what did I think about the loss and damage is that I, I, I think um, it's really important to be able to capture the kinds of losses and damages that we see happening around the, those observed and potential future ones. And that's where I think also the climate leaders here, the artists can help to capture those and um, let's say, um, make them real, bringing the voice that in the chair that, that's not here, for example, uh, as representation of the more existential changes and existential experiences that we, we are going through and will go through and have gone through in the past. Um, I think in terms of the actual negotiations and where policy and decisions are made, I think that countries are very fearful to um, get in, involved in, in sort of this issue of reparation, this issue of um, compensation, you know, dealing with the harms and dealing with the, the real, the deep stuff, if we could say that. Um, so our negotiators are probably, you know, not going to go in and from the, from the global north and say, yeah, we're finally going to engage in a discussion about what this really means on a deeper level. They're not there yet. So they will try and resist any kind of connecting to any kind of financial mechanisms that could allow for some start in, in, in dealing with the losses and damages that are, that are happening. Yeah. Um, so that leads into um, the, the kind of movements in the room there and, and amongst us who are working and studying and engaging with this is um, to bring messages about this out there, try and explain what this means. Why it is really, really important that even though we focus on mitigating, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we also have to think about the effects on people, people, um, the justice aspect that, um, that you all raised earlier on, that those, those effects will carry on for some time, even if we were to stop the meeting tomorrow, there are still effects on people and places, um, you know, intersecting between climate impacts and existing inequalities and existing conditions and so on. So we have to tackle that component as well, and that, I, I feel that that part is easy to get lost. So maybe that's where the voice is, maybe that's where the art, maybe that's where the music that you talked about. Unfortunately, we couldn't hear online, but you talked it was about love and it was about solidarity and uh, outrage. And, and the, I guess that the, the expression that a lot of people are feeling 
Um, if I looked at the artists performing uh, on the stage right now, and then I was looking also at the press conference from the Swedish government about COP, the COP negotiations, and it's just completely two different worlds, right? One is expressing and engaging and trying to find channels for the feelings that we have around this massive challenge. And the other one is very sort of orderly, organized, uh, in control. This is the only thing we're gonna tackle. We're going to invest in nuclear power plants now. And there's a sort of, uh, you know, the, the techno, um, I guess, managerial world that we also live in. Um, very different. So I guess they have different purposes, but I think for many, many people, the expression of the feeling uh, is really important. And that's maybe also where the art community facilitates and can lead us forward. Thank you. And um, COP needs to embrace culture and the arts in the room, not just as a decorative bit on the side. Um, Pear, just um, picking up on what you were talking about, you were talking about systems change, the role of crisis, and just to sort of remind us that many people are in a state of acute crisis already and have been for decades. Um, is this the kind of systems change that you're talking about? And where do you see culture and, um, and leadership, the leadership that you have in this room and to the many people who are taking that role? Where do you see them as, as locating themselves as disruptors or as... Decorators, that's an obvious question to answer, of course. <laughs> yeah, both, right? Yeah. yeah, we have to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in all parts of the system, I think. Because, I, but one aspect is that that uh, transformation is as much as being midwives or giving birth to the new innovation, scaling, impact, all those that, things that we talk about. At the same time, work on the hospice, being being hospice workers for, for to, Facing out what's not working, so I think um, that's the disruption. Maybe uh, disruption can also be like introducing an innovation, right? And uh, and I see a lot of I work a lot with startups and and others that tries to to um, uh, you know they think they have the best idea in the world that's going to change everything, but I say to them based on the science we've done that it's a it's a bigger chance that the system changes them than they are changing the system. And I think that goes for social movements too. Uh, many times we see, we see social movements being sort of having a disruptive power, but then as, uh, as time goes on, it becomes uh, an adaptive initiative instead of disruptive. So, and that means that we have to work on, on sort of facing out what holds us in, the, in those old systems of injustice and and uh, uh, and unsustainability, so uh, the hospice work I think is is one of these capacities that we have to do, and it's about letting things disrupt things, but letting things die with dignity too, uh, because I I don't want to talk too long, but but I think there's a there's a, there's a there's a a lot of people out there that are part of the old industry that has to be phased out. And, and a lot of men work in that industry. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a grief involved in losing that. And we have to take care of that grief, even though we think it's stupid or shouldn't be there. You know, they, these are people that have their income and identity in these systems. So it's important to, this hospice work is important to let things die with dignity, because grief and fear, for, of course, can be turned into hate and, and uh, anger. And that's what we see a lot in society today. Like a lot of angry, especially men, uh, that, that uh, yeah, we know what, what, what they can do, you know, with, their, with, with that anger. So it's about, I think, and I think art, uh, music, uh, everything can have a huge role to play in both, uh, you know, you know, give birth to the new, and in that in that in those uh, in those processes, but definitely in the in sort of the phasing out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Before I go on, um, is are there any questions 
from the floor or online that anybody wants to ask. We haven't heard from Andy or Cherie, so is there, before I ask a question, is, is there anybody who'd like to ask either of these two a question? No? Okay, great. And that gives more time for me. So, um, Andy, we heard so beautifully from you last night um, uh, the, the role of the, the, your movement has been very brave, very courageous, um, really out there. What, do you, what would you say, having been a, a really early, and I hope you don't mind me saying it, but a young pioneer, and I'm not that, so it's huge appreciation. I did not have your courage at your age, and I'm sure you've heard that so many times before, haven't you? But what would you say to this new collection of creative climate leaders around courage, which has come up again and again and again in our sessions? That's a great question, and I would actually like to add to what you were talking about earlier, about um, daring just to disrupt the system and get uncomfortable, because we are faced with this, this you know, unprecedented threat to humanity's survival and if we're going to change something and we're going to, if we're going to do something about it then we're going to have to change our system from the ground and that's not going to be a smooth transition it's not going to be comfortable it's not going to be anything like what we have now and obviously we may need to make sure that that transition is just and equitable and that we it's you know comes from this uh, justice centered perspective but I think that we need to dare to think in new ways. And if you know that something is the right thing to do, then you should do that, even though it goes entirely against what um, really existing, like, I guess, ideas of what your role should be uh, within a company or an organisation or as a new station or whatever, um, because we need to dare to do new things. And I guess that's pretty vague, but just like, I guess this sticking to that in a sort of more compass and doing what's right instead of doing what people expect you to do. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sharice, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. Um, I just I wanted to add, yes, the, the thing about knowing your role and finding your role is incredibly important because otherwise if you if if you don't, it's so easy to get overwhelmed and just uh, like I don't, I don't know what to do, everything is terrible, um, but if you really take the time to figure out, okay, where do I fit into all of this, and just fo it, it, focus on that, <laughs> just focus on that thing, because that matters. You can be very aware of all, everything else that's happening, but focus on your thing, bring your strengths to the table, and you, and, and you do have strengths. All of you, <laughs> you do. Um, bring those to the table. And I think something else I wanted to mention, because I didn't in my intro, um, about what uh, culture brings um, to the table here is, well, first of all, culture is such a nebulous term. <laughs> what is culture? Everything. Um, I see it as not just, I don't just see it as, you know, as artists creating art that speaks to climate. I also see it as preserving these, uh, preserving cultures, uh, preserving languages, um, and I, I see it as a way for the the sectors like what Julie's bicycle works on. Uh, I see it as as the cultural sector having uh, having an impact just within their own sector, making themselves more well, we could sustainable as it were, and and being an influence to others, right? And using that to uh, motivate and inspire. And that's what I believe all of you do, so. Yeah. yeah. It is an incredible collection of disciplines and skills and opportunities. If you look at the creative industries, culture, heritage, and the arts, what an incredible group. I just wonder if there's a creative climate leader Anima in the audience who would like to have the last word. Courage. Was there any comments that any of you would like to make? Lovely. Do you want to st stand up and then take the take the mic? Hi, thank you. Uh, so my name is Doru. I'm a journalist and photographer and. Um, 
urban mobility enthusiast and um, I was thinking about and reflecting about what you were saying and uh, one of the things that um, comes to mind is that in essence what we are trying to do is bring people together in our camp, let's say, okay? Uh, and artists do that culturally because they um, send a message that resonates with people, that message gets across, and people who are otherwise normal participants in the society uh, become active in this camp, let's say. But more needs to be done to bring uh, those people uh, in our camp in other ways because they are caught in the economic struggle, you know, paying uh, for food for an apartment and stuff like that, working maybe in the auto industry or whatever. Uh, so I was wondering how can we work towards that to bring more people uh, with us because it should be a collective effort, not just the artists that send the message, but maybe larger organizations that can um, give them, I don't know, create jobs that bring them on this side rather than just hoping they will do something in their spare time for us, let's say. So it's a larger change instead of just uh, hoping that uh, some people during the weekends uh, will do something for the environment, maybe disrupt the, the market and the jobs they have and the areas they work in so they can be all the time, you know, working for the environment and uh, in a sustainable way and doing something uh, meaningful because we can see in the, in the last years we've seen a lot, a lot of people that started to, to look for more uh, meaning in their work and uh, quitting jobs and, and things like that. So how do we move forward in a broader sense it would be my question. Thank you. Does anybody want to start on that? Uh, and then we'll need to, I'm afraid, we'll, if you want your coffee, we're going to need to finish quite quickly. Does anybody want to, do you want to, Pear, do you want to comment on that? Um, well, as a, as a scientist, then what we're trying to do at the, you know, as, as a research organization, we see a lot of like uh, synergies, you know, when we connect the uh, Anders Poulsen, we work together uh, for a long time. You know, there's a, so much, so much you can do by connecting, right? And I think we're gonna hear that from, from, from many others in the, in the other, how, yeah. how you can do that, how you yeah. can connect in new ways that you haven't done before, yeah. maybe. Yeah, and, and from our perspective, um, who've been in the movement, if you like, for a while, just to reassure you that it is mobilising. There are people all over the world, artists, uh, producers, venue operators. The, the cultural sector is moving very fast. What we need to do now is to really put pressure on uh, the cultural infrastructure to move much faster, to really pressurise policymakers so that they understand that we're not going to solve any of these systemic problems without pushing culture at the heart of it. So, but it is now an unstoppable um, force which is really inspiring and really exciting. And some of those people are in the room and online. So much appreciation to all of you. We're going to have to hang up. Does anybody want to say any, make any final comments either in the room or online? No? So what we've got now is a short break that takes us up to kind of, well, quarter of an hour or so, there's coffee, and then we'll come back to talk about that movement that I've just been talking about um, in the room. So to get coffee, you go down this corridor, through the door, is this correct? We're having coffee in the same place. Through that door, and then to your left. Great. Thank you. Thank you, panellists. Thank you, audience. Hey, uh, my name is uh, Anders Paulsen. I'm a Swedish musician and saxophonist, uh, composer, environmentalist since my father was a Boy Scout leader. 
and uh, I'm 61 years old and I'm wearing a Philippine Baron Tagalog because I'm going to play a Philippine song for you and I embrace my grey hair. I wear Converse sneakers to feel younger and, <laughs> and uh, this song is about uh, a marine sanctuary in the Philippines where I was a volunteer diver uh, doing survey dives counting corals. And uh, this island, the Hugin Island that you see there, uh, we found 244 different species of hard corals alone, which is like a biodiversity hotspot. And uh, the people living next to it, uh, the fishing village uh, that you saw on the other Eyes of Future Generations video uh, last night, uh, is uh, now in the Marine Learning Center at the Hugin Island that is uh, welcoming children from all over the Negros Islands to have marine camps and to see a real thriving coral reef. So anyway, I was really inspired by that, uh, so I have written this song called The Hugin Sanctuary.
so after that wonderful performance, we will go straight into our next panel, Creative Sector in Flux. So we'll be having a discussion about the movement mobilizing around uh, climate and culture. Um, so may I uh, bring to the stage the panelists who are in person, and then also our panelists online, and of course, our wonderful chair, Yana Escola, who is an environmentalist, an animal rights activist, a cultural practitioner, and of course, a creative climate leader. Absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, it's been for us a three day of three days of celebration of creative climate leadership. And we will we also have two panelists online here today with us, um, Jakob and Lisa. Let's give it a little moment that we get Lisa online as well. Um, my name is Jana. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman. Um, with blonde hair and fringe, of middle age, middle height. Mm, and then we can go on. We got Lisa here as well. Brilliant. Um, our great panelists here. First, we have Louise Linden. Louise is a social entrepreneur, festival organizer, and a founder of the pioneering organization Live Green Festivals and Academy. Welcome. Um, then we have here online Lisa Holmberg. Hello, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Hello from Samiland in Norway, I'm sitting. Lisa is a film commissioner at the International Sami Film Institute in Norway. Like you said, and the purpose of the institute is to support Sami languages, culture, and livelihoods. And then we have the other online panelist, Jakob Delford, is a co-founder and CEO of Berdykti Senkunst Elu. And BSN is the first Danish NGO working exclusively for the green transition in the cultural sector in Denmark and the Nordics. Thank you so much for being here online, though, but still great to be with you uh, digitally. And then we have here present Ulva Hilström who is a curator with the learning department at the Modern Rose in Stockholm. Welcome. Um, before I give the floor to our panelists, I could say a few words about the creative project that I'm working on myself at the moment. Um, I currently work as a project manager at the Helsinki Uusimaa Regional Council in, in Finland. And we're developing an action plan for cultural and creative sectors in Finland. And that is a project initiated by the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Education and Culture in Finland. And our project is to um, create an action plan and a roadmap for all the cultural sectors and creative sectors in the country. And currently in Finland, as I think the case is in Denmark as well, there's a lot of sustainability initiatives going on, smaller initiatives, and a lot of knowledge, but there's no, there's no umbrella project bringing that knowledge together. So now our big push, push will be in the next 10 months to come to organize a series of workshop, workshops in dialogue with the field to bring that knowledge together and develop a CO2 calculator that would suit well the greatest sectors in Finland and, and take that best knowledge forward. And I'm happy to hear the, the similar experience from Denmark, from Jakob later on today. And of course, first and foremost, our goal is to highlight the transformative power of arts and culture and bring the knowledge in the heart of climate action. But now I would actually like to hear what our panelists are doing. So I'll first give the floor to Louise, and if you want a little bit share about your ongoing projects. Thank you so much. Is it okay if I stand up? Of 
course. Great, because I want to see my, uh, I have some slides to show. Um, very happy to be here, uh, Louise Linden, uh, she, her. I have uh, long brown hair, I have a golden necklace with an anti-sexist message on it, and I have black um, snickerbyxor. I don't know what's the English word for that, but yeah, you can Google it. <laughs> um, yeah, very happy to be here, and um, slides, please. Yes, that's my purple color, great. Um, so, we can solve the climate crisis without creativity, and we can solve it without imagination, and we can solve it alone, by ourselves. And uh, these three things, uh, creativity, imagination, and community, are kind of the core of a music festival. So, when I was 18 years old, and I learned about the climate change, and I was hit by what we in Sweden say climat ångest, uh, climate anxiety, my reaction was to quit school and start a music festival. Which many grown-ups thought was a very bad idea because you know you're supposed to go to school and get good grades and everything. But for me it was the most reasonable thing to do, actually. Uh, because you can't uh, change the world from within a classroom. Uh, and this actually turned out to be the best mistake uh, of my life because um, that was how Live Green uh, started. Uh, and it's been my dream job for 12 years. So since 2011, we have actually used our festival uh, as playground for sustainable innovation and transformation. Because, uh, you know, we can actually learn how to build a sustainable society by building more sustainable festivals. Because festivals are like temporary cities. Another fun fact is that when people go to festivals, they are more open-minded and curious than usual. Also, we have all the actors in society, like companies, for example, who wants to be associated with our festivals and who wants to access our target uh, group. Uh, so we actually have amazing opportunities and we have a power to challenge business as usual and create new norms at festivals. So that's one of the things that we do at Live Green. We simply support and educate event professionals uh, to minimize their negative footprint and maximize their positive impact. However, festivals are a mirror of society and they can't be sustainable as long as society isn't. So we also need to put pressure on the people in power, business leaders, political leaders and so on, to act against the crisis. Um, you can change slide. So two years ago, um, young activists from Fridays for Future in the UK, they reached out to us at Live Green and they said we need to make more people care about climate justice and we need to mobilize a new crowd, otherwise we're going to fail. And we believe that music can help us with this. And they wanted to start a new global movement called Climate Live. So, uh, in Sweden, together with Fridays for Future and with support from Svenska Postkodstiftelsen, the Postcode Foundation, we started Climate Live here. Um, so, for one year, uh, we have organized four youth-led concerts around Sweden. Uh, we have had more than 30 of the biggest artists publicly taking a stand for climate justice and we've had activists on stage in front of the biggest arena crowd in uh, Scandinavia at Håkan Hemstrom's concert at Ullevi this summer. Um, 72,000 people. And the outreach has been enormous. And I think that this is actually one of many evidence that the cultural industry can really play a very, very important role uh, in the sustainable transformation we're heading toward. So all of us who work in this sector, I think we need to be very brave. We need to continue to be very curious all the time. We need to be generous because there's no place for a big ego in the situation we are at. We need to share brilliant ideas and we need to support each other because we're all in this together. And also we need to be very, very radical. You know, because we need to do big changes. And working with young activists, such as Alden Douglas that you have met here, that's actually one way of making sure that you stay radical. So that's actually one thing I would like to, to, to say to you, like take the opportunity and learn from the young, because they can help us to just continue being radical, and that's one thing that is needed. So yeah, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. I will sit down now. Just amazing. Um, I would give now the, the mic to Lisa. 
Thank you. That was a very strong statement you, you made, Louis. I like when you are saying that the festivals are the mirror of the society. I, I really, really like that because we are saying, the filmmakers, that um, our statement is that the, 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 those ones who are telling the best story, they will survive and uh, maybe they will give, give the solution to this uh, climate crisis. So, my name is Lisa Holmberg and uh, I'm a blonde, round, middle-aged, Sami person with my Sami costume and I have my Sami uh, solidu, we call them, and they are symbol of the sun. Uh, the sun is very important and the sun and moon, they are very important in our, uh, in our uh, culture. I will find uh, my some slides. Slides I will show you there. Now I'm sharing. You can see that. Um, can you see this? Yes. yes. Okay. So I'm not talking about the. Uh, um, International Sami Film Institute so much, it's the Sami Film Institute, but we have created three, uh, four years ago this Arctic Indigenous Film Fund where we are supporting all Arctic filmmakers, indigenous filmmakers in, in Canada, in Alaska, in Greenland, in Samiland and in uh, Russia also. But Russia is now a little bit problematic because, because of the war in the Russian war in Ukraine, but we created this with uh, with Sundance Institute, Canada Media Fund, uh, Greenlandic Film, and Nunavut Film Development Corporation, and then Saha Film. And uh, but if I'm going very fast track back in our our history, we started our Indigenous Film Festivals 1999. Now we have the 25th anniversary in this year. So we invited always indigenous, other indigenous peoples to come and tell their stories in our screen, like the snow theater in the snow screen. Of course, we have also inside screens, but the snow theater is our our speciality. So why it is important to have um, these um, places and arenas where indigenous people uh, can, uh, can tell their stories in their own way. The media business in the world is the rapidly growing business in, in the whole world and it is affecting a lot of people's minds and people's um, political, also the political climate. So it's very important that our people can give the voice out. So we started in with our own festival in, uh, then we were reaching out to our, the, the biggest festival in the world, like Berlinale. We had an indigenous cinema there uh, almost five years. And then we are still in the European film market. We are in the indigenous stand there. So with other, not only Arctic indigenous, but also Australian, Brazilian, uh, New Zealand. Then we have a, 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 a very good connection to Cannes. Last year or this year, May, we were there in the producers network. So with the, the five indigenous producers around the Arctic. And it's very important, producers are the key people to, in order to make the decision what kind of story we are telling and how we are telling. And, uh, 
and then the directors are making the stories, but producers are finding the funding, and then they are finding the places where to screen and selling those films. So we are supporting very strongly our indigenous producers all around the world. Then we were in the Venice Film Festival and Venice Biennale in this September, October. We had our giant Lavo TV there and we had a new way to tell the stories. There was the 360 screen inside this Lavo. So you, those people are lying there, they are going directly inside the films. We had the six seven Sami films and six Canadian indigenous films going there two weeks in the Venice Biennale. And this was very good way to waking up the, the film people and also the audience of Venice Biennale and Venice Film Festival that, that uh, we can tell the stories in the new way. Also, our storytelling model is like a sort of a round. So this kind of round screen was very good way to tell our stories. And then, of course, we are trying to go near those biggest of big, <laughs> like Netflix. We have a Netflix uh, agreement with them now for the next year, may, making capacity building, but also productions. And uh, then we have some BBC connections, and then we have made a Telefilm Canada to our partner. So this is our way, how we are doing um, this uh, work and why it is so important. It is important, as, as I said in the, uh, in the beginning, that we have to make our voice and images out to the world. And why it's important in this climate talk it is the, that we could make the we our filmmakers up in the more, no, uh, Arctic they can make this uh, tipping points visible like Arctic sea ice like Greenlandic ice sheet like permafrost like uh, Atlantic circulation and uh, and then what is it, how we can cope. It's not only that we are showing how it's affecting or what is happening in the Arctic, but also how we will cope with this and trying to find the solution, being part of the solution, not a uh, not, um, problem. And in the end, I will say that the question, what is the creative climate leadership for you, it is the it is the, that we need to take climate leadership back from the big business leaders to the community leaders in the, in the local communities. That's my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And if there's questions to Lisa and the others, we'll get back to that later. We hopefully have a little bit of time for that. But now I give the mic to Jakob. Go ahead. Thank you so much. I hope you all can hear me. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so I prepared a little chat slideshow, and I know, um, first of all, I need to present myself. I go by the pronouns he, him. Um, today I am wearing this sweater uh, with this blue and white. I hope you can see just a little bit. I got it from my mother and that it resembles the water and the sea that I love so much um, because I have a sailing boat and I love taking my family out sailing. I prepared a slideshow today and I know uh, it might be a little hectic because I have so much I want to say here. So uh, buckle up for the ride and let's see if we can make it. Um, so first of all, why should culture and arts be at the forefront of sustainable transport? 
We at Bayer Design Corps, new, which can be translated to sustainable performing arts now, have from the very get-go, three years ago, been very inspired by Julius Bicycle, and I'm working already closely with Alison and the rest of the team because, as we say, why invent the wheel if it's already been invented? So in this case, why should culture and arts be at the forefront of the sustainable transition? The IPC report states, the one that came out in February of this year, one of the main reasons for not being further ahead of the green transition in Europe is due to the absence of art and culture in all aspects of the process. This is a quote from Madeleine Kate McGovern, who's a Danish um, speculative designer who actually read the report and actually looked it through. She's one of our good friends and colleagues. And, and this is really interesting to see that we have to step up our game as arts and culture sector because we present new narratives in the minds and hearts of the audiences. So we have the key to this transition. Um, with the, the 17 UN goals, you could ask yourself, where is culture there? Why not the 18th goal? In this case, uh, as we can see it working, especially with municipalities, we can see that when they want to um, transform the 17 UN goals into real action in the society, they are dependent on culture. So in a way, in this case, you could actually say that culture could be the very top uh, goal uh, all uh, on top of the 17 world goals, and then you see them trickle down, she called it trickle down, within each of the goals. Um, within the cultural sector, we can see four major emitters, if you could say so, the largest areas within the cultural sector where we get climate impact. It's touring, it's buildings and operations, it's audience transportations, and it's an in materials. And we can see in this case, that collaboration is key, so if we can share ideas between, in this case, the Nordic countries, we can really accelerate the green transition, not only within the cultural sector, but in the broad society in general. Uh, to me, I find it quite interesting, the whole uh, thing with audience transportation, because you could say it's not really the, um, uh, the responsibility of the cultural institutions to decide on how the audience transport themselves, but if we can encourage people to change behavior, it can really make an impact. And we should, because as we say um, on the climate watch, the talk is already five minutes past midnight. It's, it, it's urgent that we all act now. Um, yes, let me see if I can change the slide here. Yes, okay. Um, we created this um, declaration of intent together with uh, different organizations in Denmark and right now more than 40 theatres and more than 17 symphonic and opera houses uh, across the Nordic have uh, signed this declaration. Uh, it's first of all a political statement saying that uh, climate, the climate issue is the burning issue of our time and that you as a cultural institution will do anything you can in order to change um, your behaviour and encourage others to do so. Um, it also consists of eight focus areas with a lot of action points that you can dive into so you can take action because we are really voting for action now. No more talking about good intentions, turn it into action. So here you see the eight different areas. Um, I hope that these slides can also be uh, distributed afterwards because we have a little short time here. I want to focus here on one of the theatres that we've been working with in Denmark who have made their baseline um, report on their climate impact of two productions and then change behavior. And as you can see here in the two paragraphs here, they really made a difference. They minimized their climate impact with over 70% by following theater green book standards that you probably heard of these theater green book standards are really something that we encourage everybody to use. Um, they also achieved this goal of a 70% reduction by creating sustainable policy and annual climate action plans and by involving everybody in that organization and in their production because you have to feel engaged, you have to feel that you are a part of this necessary um, change. Um, I also just want to briefly touch upon this vision that we have now that we're putting into change together with especially Linnea Liebberg from High Sweden but a lot of other interest uh, organizations right now. It's called Nordic Acts, Nordic Alliance for Cultural Transition and Sustainability. We see it as an online resource hub with multiple EO2 calculators, 
we bubbled up with Julie's bicycle, uh, so we can align with pedology. We bubbled up with Theatre Green Book, so we use the same standards. And then it's important that you use natural emission facts. You want to um, measure your carbon footprint. But what is most important with this, uh, not only digital platform, but with this um, resource hub, is that we can share climate initiatives because we don't have copyright, we have the right to copy. Right? This is really important. So if you see a good idea, somebody who is trying out something that works, why not copy that and share that? So this is really about getting the degree and getting very um, practical when implementing sustainable changes within your organizations. Here's an idea. Imagine that you make this um, baseline uh, calculation on a cultural institution then you also add audience transportation. In this case, it, by encouraging audience travel and transportation, if you can change behavior there and ask people to use their bicycle, their train to set up cars or flying, you could actually lower the amount of the carbon emission on the audience area, and then it will give you the possibility to still create the necessary cultural production that is so important to sustain a community. So in this case, you can lower your impact on one area and then you can still maintain that you can create a quality a cultural product the other hand. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on this because I can see we're short on time, but we created, um, just to give an example of, of why it's necessary to operate, we created a cooperation with the four biggest theatres in Copenhagen where we created workshops and seminars really to create this kind of literacy Julius Bicycle is always talking about is so necessary. We, together with the four theaters, we created a catalog of ideas. We out, outpointed climate champions within each department, and then sharing of space, materials, and knowledge is where they're working at right now. How can they, between the four theaters, really share space, material, and knowledge? So, what can cultural institutions do? First of all, it's necessary to create a climate policy for your organization create an annual climate action plan where you decide which climate initiatives you want to implement, create a baseline analysis of your climate impact so you have a, you have some kind of a foundation to take some choices, some, to take some decisions. What is next? Well, with this uh, Nordic X, the digital platform, and with all the networking that's going on all to the day um, here with the, the CCO meeting, it's important to focus on case studies, best practice and climate initiatives, hopefully on annual national conferences within the cultural sector, regional seminars and local network meetings, so we can keep on sharing knowledge and team up with all the good knowledge partners see is out there already. So how does change look? It looks like this, and I wanted to show you this picture because I get so happy when I see it, because this is what change can be like it's about relation, it's about being close to each other, and it's about sharing ideas. In this case, the pictures you see here are different organizations and institutions who have implemented climate initiatives. They created their own unique climate initiative that they're implementing in their organizations. And I, I get so happy when I see this picture because this is really what it's all about. We all together created historically the climate crisis that we're in, so we are all obligated to solve it together. Um, we recommend that you learn more about sustainable cultural production. We have a various bunch of free guides on our website. You can identify what sustainable actions you're already doing. It's so important so you don't lose hope. You're already on the way. Decide what kind of initiatives you want to implement in your work. Share knowledge, best case studies with each other. And then for sure, you're also very welcome to join the Nordic Network meeting on the 8th of November. And here you see a QR code for, we have a climate calculator we, that's free to use, which is based upon creative green tools by Julius Bicycle. And we have the free guides on sustainability. And you're more than welcome to reach out because the, we say, the more we are, the more we know all together and knowledge shall push us through this stuff. Thank you so much. Yes, hello. My name is Ylva Hilström, and my pronouns are she, her. I am a white woman in my 40s, and I am brown-haired and brown-eyed. 
and I work as a curator at the Moderna Museum, the Museum of Modern Art in Stockholm. And I have been working with sustainability and the climate crisis for a few years now within the museum. And in 2016, uh, we initiated a digital platform that uh, was called Acclimatize, where we invited people from all over the world, all ages, to upload creative responses to the climate crisis. And this was a very inspiring project, uh, project to us, so we have kept working under the name of Acclimatize and doing different types of projects, engagement projects, workshops, working with schools. And I will now present briefly uh, the most recent one, uh, which was a project uh, called Good Grön uh, by the Turner Prize winning British artist Jeremy Della. I contacted him uh, to ask him to create something together with us to coincide with Stockholm Plus 50, the environmental high level meeting that took place in Stockholm in June this year. And he agreed to do so, and we started a collaboration with him and the Global Commons Alliance. And Jeremy immediately knew that he wanted to do something with food. I had asked him to not stay within the walls of the museum, but instead go out in society, in the public realm, to, to, to create something there. And that's the way he normally works, so that, uh, that resonated with him, of course. And he wanted to work with food, because food is a key factor if we're going to stay within the planetary boundaries. So we, what we did was we produced 10,000 climate-friendly, body-friendly energy bars that were handed out for free uh, on June 3rd, the last day of Stockholm Plus 50, uh, to commuters, to university students, and to the delegates of uh, the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting. Uh, these energy bars contained apples, blackcurrant, honey, oats, and sugar kelp from the Swedish West Coast, so everything could be locally sourced. And the idea was that this was really edible sculptures, and people could have them, and were invited to think about what do we do with the energy that we consume? We're in the middle of an energy crisis. What energy do we take into our systems, and what would you, do we do with the energy we have? How can we use them to make positive things, do more good, do less bad. Uh, handing out things for free is, of course, a well-known marketing strategy, but this was the opposite of uh, regular marketing, because we were totally non-commercial. This was not a product that was going in the market. Uh, so it was just an experience, an opportunity to digest the challenges that we face. Um, so we produced these posters that could be seen all around Stockholm for about three weeks around this state in June. Uh, this one says, Mart and Climat, food is climate, and then we had uh, kelp helps. The sugar kelp was a central ingredient because it's sustainable and it's super, super, duper healthy. And we also, uh, Jeremy wanted to work with schools, so we treated 5,000 school kids in Stockholm this day, 3rd of June, to a healthy, sustainable future food lunch, consisting of mainly vegetarian things. Uh, they got to eat uh, pesto, done with, made with sugar kelp, and for those brave ones, uh, we also offered some insect protein, and insect granola. So this is just to tell you how we at Modern Museum, a state-funded institution, went out to collaborate with great partners, Stockholm Kunst helped us finance this post campaign to meet people where they were and help them take the crisis into their bodies. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. I think we're running short in time now. Um, we well, would love to welcome... Ten minutes. Okay, ten minutes more. Okay, brilliant. Uh, I would love to open the floor to questions if there is anybody here in the room or online who would like to 
ask our panelists, thank you for these four amazing examples. Thanks for sharing, all of you. Um, I can't really see you well, but if you just raise your hands. Julia. Thank you for fantastic uh, presentations. My name is Julie. I come from climate culture, climate culture in Norway, an NGO working on all of, all of this. Uh, I have a question for anyone in the panel. Um, we see so much engagement and so much, so many great projects from the cultural and the creative sector. Do you have any suggestions how we can implement and get engaged and involve our politicians and the policy makers in all this great energy? Thank you. Who would like to go? Who is? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I can start. But that's a very good question and I think it's not a quick fix and it's really a hard thing to do. Um, so what I learned like the last year working with Climate Live, uh, the strategy there is, is not really to uh, you know, go straight to the politicians and say that you need to act on this and this, but it's more about mobilizing people, uniting people and raise more awareness. Uh, really create a movement because that's what makes political leaders listen eventually, hopefully. Um, so I would say that's, that's one thing um, and that's also the strength we have as cultural industry. But I also think that we as an industry need to work more together uh, to also put pressure on the politicians together. Um, because we see that other industries who are better than us, uh, they survived the pandemic much better, but the politicians shut down the cultural industry with no hesitation. Uh, so we also need to, you know, work together more uh, and also to, yeah, just be proud of what we do because we, we, we create so much value for society and they should respect the culture. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's one thing. Not easy, but let's keep that conversation going, definitely. Thank you. Um, I could follow up on that uh, question to Jakob, because it seems that things are moving very rapidly in Denmark at the moment. So, how, what do you feel that has been the biggest driver of change now? That things started like moving so much forward. First of all, I need to apologize that I'm sitting in a car, but uh, that's how it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, in this case, what we can see at work here also to, to answer Julius question is that um, collaborating with um, large organizations within the sector, in, you know, for instance, in Sweden it could be Film and Scene Coast, or in Norway it could be uh, Norsk Theater or Opera uh, for NCO. It could be different large organizations within the corporate sector. When you team up with them, it's easier to create the transition. Um, and, and in this case, um, when reaching out to politicians, we can see that, again, relation is key. So, for instance, we, we were able to, to put through three million crowns for a Danish um, a center for sustainable uh, transition within the cultural sector. It has only been possible because of well, basic lobby work that you actually reach out to your politicians and if you can stand united with other organizations um, or refer to data from others that um, state how important culture is in the transition within society, then uh, it's easier to, to uh, reach the politicians. Thank you. Um, is there any more questions in the audience here? Do we have any questions online? No. Okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead, please. Can I just say something in response to maybe your question, Julie? Just something that I think of uh, at the museum. We, uh, there are lots of good intentions. We have consensus that we want to work with sustainability issues and also the climate crisis. But these things tend to get lost in prioritization. Uh, when it, at the end of the day, uh, when there is not much time and there is uh, limited budgets, these issues get lost. So I would love if 
our policy makers could ask of us, we're a state-funded institution, we have regulating sphere, we have a letter from the government each year saying which groups to prioritize, what to work with especially. I would love if that letter could include that there are expectations that we should make this a priority. So, so just give us uh, give us that direction and we will lead, we will follow. Thank you, very good point. Um, I would have a question to Lisa. Um, thanks for being with us here today. Um, if, if you could have a wish to Nordic arts sector, like what would that be? How would we give more visibility to the independent filmmakers? Yeah, I, I think that if I could have a wish, <laughs> so I, I would say that the, the most important is that we have to make the bridge well, from the communities, from the art communities to the political leaders and to from the researchers in the Arctic who can who can see we can we indigenous people who are living here we can see it every day and then we can film it but then uh, the research work the academic work can make it in write it down in the paper everybody is reading and saying this is true <laughs> and then. We will make the package so that visibility to those political leaders, so that they understand. But I also, in, I also uh, believe in the media, the films, and the, uh, all this um, spreading the information. The more people can understand what is happening feeling what is happening, not, if, not only that we can read everywhere what is happening, but somehow feeling that this is happening really. So to understand that and also that there will be a solution together. And I like the idea that the, the creative industry is working together, all sectors. Thank you. Would our panelists like to comment on that? I, I would like to comment. Yes, go ahead. Um, also, by just saying that um, when when going into the whole climate issue, the the sense of apathy or climate anxiety is so easy to fall into. Um, so in this case, I I can see how important it is that we stand united, also between the Nordic countries. And in this case, I just want to give my Biggest thanks to, to Julius Weiser in this case and all CCL because this, we're actually doing what we're talking about. You in the room and we online, and we're actually doing what we're talking about. We are connecting to each other, we're sharing ideas. So it's also important to, to remember, remember that so we don't get caught up in apathy or anxiety. Yeah. Thank you. I think that, that those are good words to finish with. We're running a little bit out of time here, um, but I want to thank you one, once more, our panelists, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much to this lovely panel. I mean, another round of applause for them. <laughs> so, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is you all are lovely and we have another performance. The bad news is we are running behind, so we don't have time for the full break. But what I want you to do, since you've been sitting here, is if, if you want, just stand up and stretch and, and get it up. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Good. Wiggle it out. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So um, next for our performance, we have another 
creative, climate, leadership, alumni, singer, Marta Wolf on piano singing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
the second one uh, is from the same album, and it's just... Um, I, I told somebody I completely stopped uh, making, uh, well, writing love songs uh, since concentrating on this much more important thing. Uh, but it's not really true. It's, um, this is most definitely a love song. It's just another uh, kind of love. Uh, it's like a, a love for, you know, um, everything that is uh, alive and everything that I come from. The, forests and the ocean and the earth. So um, this is called Ansicht, it means uh, face. He might join me in a solo. Det er alltid fint 
this eternity of lot if we ever needed an argument for bringing culture into the heart of climate action. We've just heard it. Amazing, wonderful. Thank you both. Makes me so awed by the possibilities of creativity um, in this new space. So, uh, thank you. We're going to finish off um, with a, a, a conversation about policy, which was really nice that Julie asked that question, because we can pick it up. And we've got some stunning people. As usual, Julie's bicycle has found it impossible to, um, to keep the number of people down, because there are so many amazing voices. But um, can I welcome onto the stage um, Nicholas, uh, Salve, Linnea, Jessica and Smilla. Great. So, um, what we're going to look at now is policy, one of this, this very slippery word because it applies so much to so many different dimensions of climate. And it is, again, I'm just going to remind us that we are um, days away from the biggest policy moment on the planet around climate. Um, but basically, if we, if we really sort of um, concentrate policy down to what governance looks like, what good stewardship, what are the overarching frames and values, and therefore what are the narratives, priorities, and crucially the resources, that are um, unleashed through a policy commitment um, and what follows on. And um, I'd like to ask to, if, if policy is anything, it's about governance. And we know that some of the governance structures by which we're working are dysfunctional um, at best. They take a long time sometimes to translate and transform. So what are the conditions that are needed to optimise um, their chances of success. Just very briefly, if we can hear from these amazing people, if we just um, run quickly, if you could just say something very briefly about yourselves, um, why don't we start with Solvay? Well, um, thank you. Uh, yes, so my name is Solvay and I'm, um, I'm 38 years old. I'm quite tall and since this is a green party and we're screaming for green solutions I thought I would bring a I would dress in a screaming green suit <laughs> typically bureaucratic <laughs> um, yes I'm a bureaucrat I'm a researcher and I work for something called uh, Kultur Tanken Arts for Young Audiences Norway which is an underlying agency of the Ministry of Culture in Norway and we focus on culture by with and for young people and Kultur Tanken has the national responsibility for uh, the cultural work sec, the Kulturelle Skolesekken, which reaches 800,000 um, school children every year in Norway. And we employ more than 3,000 artists every year, artists, presenters and performers in the schools. And we also manage several national grant teams uh, to, yeah, for increased participation in cultural life among young people and also to, yeah, for the participation in municipal planning. Um, yes, so as a government agency, we have a great scope of contributing to climate solutions, both in terms of practical, on the ground level, through the cultural school bank, but also, um, yeah, to create policies with the Ministry of Culture and Education in Norway. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Linnea Elisabeth Svensson. Um, I'm pronounced uh, she or her. I'm half Swedish, which my name kind of uh, tells, but I grew up in Norway, so I'm 50-50. Very nice to be here. Um, I'm deeply touched by today's topic and all of the engagement, so thank you everybody for what you are doing. Um, we live beyond our means and I lived um, for 44 years myself. I wear black. Uh, so not a bit more this topic than uh, Solvay. I worked with uh, sustainability in events and the experience sector for more than 20 years. So I'm utterly impatient. So I'm just going to apologize already for that. 
Hello, um, you've already seen me. Um, so my name is Jessica Nordstrom Sicker and I pronounce um, she or her and um, I wear a green sweater, sort of in the same theme as you mentioned there. Um, and um, yeah, 45 plus glasses, blondish, long hair. And um, yeah, we, um, I work at the Swedish Postcode Foundation, as you know, and we provide earmarked project support to, um, to non-profit organizations in Sweden and abroad, and we work in four broad um, areas, broadly defined areas. It's, it's uh, environment and climate, arts and culture, people's living conditions, sports for development. And within all these four areas, we have specific strategies worked out and we set um, priorities for each year. And uh, we work with arts and culture and the intersection of arts and culture and, and environment and climate within two of these strategies. So both from the perspective of the um, strategy for environment and climate and for um, arts and culture. So for environment and climate, we, um, we sort of, the strategy is divided in, or is sort of a, a, a triangle um, or a pyramid. And at the bottom level, we work with mobilization. So we can support projects that uh, run by artists and culture organizations um, to mobilize or engage a larger community for committing to uh, the environment and planet and Climate Live is one of those initiatives that we've supported that we've heard about earlier today and um, we also have an ambition to support um, organizations that are not traditional environmental NGOs um, in um, strengthening their capacity and knowledge and ability to act on the climate change and um, ecological crisis. So this is why we've supported this Creative Climate Leadership Program, for example. And um, within our arts and culture strategy, we have a new area or a new priority now that we've, uh, where we want to, we call it in Swedish, in Swedish um, kreativitet, fantasy och föreställningsförmåga. So, creativity and imagination, um, in English perhaps, and um, where we want to find projects that work more in an exploratory or experimental way of looking into um, new narratives and uncertainties and perhaps work in a more pro process-based way of um, finding new visions of imagining what it would be to live in a sustainable world, for example. Um, yeah, that would be it. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you. I'm happy to be able to be present here during this afternoon. My name is Niklas Malmkrona, he, him, and I'm a white, little bit more than middle-aged man. I'd like to think that my hair is still blonde, but I realize that it's actually gray nowadays. Uh, I'm wearing blue trousers, dark blue trousers, and a dark gray sweater. I am uh, the director or Verksamhetsleder for SETA Sweden, and SETA is an, both an international organization and network with uh, branches in more than 100 countries around the world. And, and we work to, to support and, and enhance the cooperation between professionals within the field of performing arts for children and young people throughout the world. And uh, as the international part, as a Swede, as SSA Sweden, we are also a membership organization. So more or less all Swedish theater, dance companies, regional theaters, city theaters, organizations are our members. So we work to, to support them in different ways. We organize seminars, workshops, festivals, 
and we have a lot of international cooperation, especially within the, the Nordic and Baltic area. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm also incredibly honored to be here. My name is Smilla, and uh, I'm wearing a white blouse, uh, some uh, yellow polka dot pattern pants. Um, I have uh, fired color hair braided into two braids, and uh, on top of my head, I have a beret with a. It looks like planet Earth, if you can see that. Um, so. I am 24 years old and I'm Caucasian. My pronouns are she, her. And um, I'm an artist and a climate activist. Right now I'm working for Greenpeace and I'm also, I think in total I'm a member of 12 organizations right now. Um, so uh, at the moment I uh, have an active exhibition at the Technical Museum in Stockholm. It's a part of Zero City, uh, together with the field biologist. Oh, and I'm also together with an organization called Aurora. I'm suing the government for inadequate climate action. Thank you. So, a really simple question, and I'm not going to ask people um, on the panel who have organisations if they have a, an environmental policy. But um, given the, the scale of the problem we've got, we're facing possible um, devastation of life as we know it. And it is as big as that. And given that policies are around governance, stewardship, care, protection, safety, security, and the greater good, what on earth has gone wrong? So that we are in a situation where our lives and the lives of many have either been uh, imperiled um, and in many cases actually lost, livelihoods have been lost, um, and we still are finding that the movement to create frameworks in which the, the most um, critical issues of our lives are being led by um, grassroots activists, by cultural activists, by, by civil society. What has happened? Would anybody like to jump in and tell us what you think are the big barriers for recognising this invitation, this compelling invitation, to take on the mantle of good governance? <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> well, I'll try. Um, I think that one of the things that has grow gone wrong is that we have diminished the sense of values to a question of right-wing, left-wing thing in politics and who's governing when. And we don't really move into the core of value and of value conscious leadership. Um, and I think that's like so, I think the answer to your question is kind of around there somewhere. And it's not all about the practical and technical solutions about finding kind of the policy that will get it there, but it's about, about daring to speak about values and leading from a universal stance and from universal principles of justice, equity, dignity, and leading with compassion and with an integrity lens, and finding ways of translating those values into everything that we do. Yeah. So I think that that's, and that's, as someone working in the system, as a researcher and as a bureaucrat, I think that or at least I have a personal fear, uh, fear of speaking too much and too loud about those values because, or at least up to now, I have had that fear. No, I don't have it anymore. No, I think it's absolutely crucial that we speak about those values and translate it into action uh, because I was scared of not appearing as professional, as not understanding my role. Uh, but I do think that we cannot go anywhere and cannot create policies that are effective in this field unless we work with those values. 
Thank you. Yep. Terrific. I'm just going to follow up on that. And I really believe um, that we now have a very much monetary and uh, tabloid policy uh, in the politicians, but also in the policy makers, uh, where we have a lot of fear. Mm. We have fear of making mistakes and being too blunt or to be um, to do something wrong. And that's why everybody keeps low and they don't dare to stick up. And those who sticks up, we have a fam some famous uh, environmental Green Party politicians in Oslo, which has done a lot of, uh, you know, incredibly important work. They are being bullied uh, to the extent that uh, I'm so impressed that they still are active politicians. You know, so it's something about the media and the social media situation that makes it um, focus, like so way it says, in the wrong values. It's yeah. about being the populistic uh, leader and always targeting, you know, the next um, survey to see how you're doing. Yeah. So it's kind of a market-based politics, always looking for where the money is, you know. Okay. And the fantastic. Can I ask Nicholas um, a question, picking up on those two? So you are a, a, somebody who's stewarding a network made up of the sum of its parts. Um, in your network, uh, at what do you think are the challenges for your members? Do you help them? That's a, this is a very direct question. Do you help them, um, or do you sense that there is reluctance? Where, is it, where are the barriers for your members, and they are, it is a global network, um, to adopt ambitious and realistic um, responses to the climate challenge? Well, what I have experienced, and what I have realized during many years now, because I have, I have had the privilege to be able to work internationally. Mm. And I have been attending, attending so many festivals, so many meetings, so many sem seminars around the world. And I have a feeling, and I don't have the solution to it, but I have a feeling that there has been, there are so much talking. We have talked about diversity, we have talked about inclusiveness, we have talked about sustainability. But then, when we get to, together again after a year or two, I realize that we are still the same white, middle-aged people from the global north meeting again. So I have, um, I decided for myself that, that I, I, I don't want to talk anymore, I want to do things. And I think it's important for us as an organization, both international and, and uh, as a Swedish organization, that we although we are a small organization, that we can try to be a platform and to make it possible for people to get together, to meet and to discuss these issues. And when it com comes to climate change, for example, we started uh, last year, we created, the, and it was a little bit inspired uh, from the, when I went to the CCL course, and, and we created these workshop series for our members where we, during half a year, organized five uh, workshop meetings talking about climate change, sustainability, and how we together can learn more, and how we can discuss it, and how we can move forward. And we also worked with Beredukti Sinekonst, with, with Jacob, and they helped us a lot in, in creating a, a possibility to, to, to work together and try to learn more from each other. But it's a very slow work and it takes time and sometimes me and my colleagues get very frustrated. But I think we have to realize that it takes time. But, but I feel a lot that, that we should stop talk and work more for concrete action. I think probably most people would agree. <laughs> Thank you. So you're in the extraordinary position. First of all, I thank you for the funding programs that you've made available on climate action. Um, and we all know that we couldn't do much if it wasn't for uh, resources. And that's a huge issue. There is nothing like enough um, resource being put into this 
uh, place. And neither is there enough resource being forced into this space. So Jessica, from your point of view as a funder, um, who actually has just a bit, bit of a shout out for Jessica, who is also a creative climate leader, has been incredibly supportive personally, pitched in to make this happen. Where are the barriers for you, I, obviously, um, within, within the team that you work in and in the wider philanthropic world? And I'm just going to call you a philanthropic, even though it's, it's all sorts of different. Mm -hmm. But where is that? Because one thing that this movement needs, these artists, these creative practitioners, is they need resources and support in order to affect change. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sorry, what was... So, what where, is, where, as, a, as, a, as a funder, yep. where do you feel are the sticky points, both um, within the sort of funding community mm. and, also, um, and also more widely? Oh, I think there are... I mean, in some parts of the world, um, there are a lot happening. Uh, in regards to funding, um, I know, for example, we've met with, and uh, you're working with Arts Council of England that have come quite far in um, working on climate work in, in culture, um, both in supporting organizations and, and demanding and require reporting and um, planning. And um, I think it's I mean, there are different challenges within the funding system, obviously, um, depending on if you're a public funder or a private funder. I mean, public funders are obviously um, depending on the cultural policy uh, for the country, the region, and the municipality. Um, there may be issues in regards to what type of Support is the best way of doing it. Is it sort of uh, using carrot or stick? Yeah. Uh, is it requiring and demanding um, reporting, or which could be uh, a tricky issue? I think in, in Sweden at least, or is it sort of inspiring, supporting um, for organisations to take action or to be able to trans. Um, um, transform their own uh, their own green transition, um, and I think um, and uh, we as a private funder we have I guess I mean we have regulations that we and frameworks that we have to relate to, but we are much a bit more free of what we can do and not do, um, but um, I don't. I don't no, really. Why it's why it's not uh, going as quickly as it should be, and I yeah. think that there are probably there are different challenges challenges for different funders. Yeah, and um, I wish that a lot more would happen, and I wish that we could cooperate more, um, see more collaboration within the funding system, and perhaps. Um, find what different roles we can take, what could we as a private funder support, um, how could we supplement the funding that uh, the public funders could do. Um, I think there is much to do. So, creative climate leadership, there is your legacy project, is to break this deadlock, this funding deadlock. Because I'd like to now to bring in Smiller, of course. So, you know, uh, we're all, all of us, probably everybody listening, our signatory is the Paris Agreement. We have all committed in our legal frameworks to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, to live in a tolerably safe world. And, um, and yet, not only are those adrift politically, but also within culture, we have huge drift huge drift between cultural policy and committed legal, legally signed up to binding international and national climate targets. So how does that make you feel, Samantha? I kind of feel like that's really missing some really big points here. Like, I, I see two big challenges here. The first one is that, 
like we fail to engage people in some some bigger mobilization. Um, I, we only focus on individual action, and we do that way too much. Uh, what we would have to do is to talk more about how we can get organized, because there are a few things that really, really needs to to happen right now. Uh, and also, I think the second challenge is that the major institutions, they kind of fail to see the historical aspect that art has had in, in previous movements. Like for example with the suffragette movement, uh, when art came into the picture, like uh, when the suffragettes started using like visual images in their communication instead of just having text on their like flyers and stuff, then things went quite fast actually. Um, so I think that like using art as a political tool, I think that can be incredibly crucial and it might be one of our last hopes right now. Um, and failing to see that, I mean that really, it bothers me a lot. Thank you. Do we have any questions from... Um, yes, that would be terrific. Yeah. Hi everyone, um, and thank you so much for this panel. Uh, so my name is Inky, my pronouns are they them, and I am here today from the Centre for Environmental and Development Studies at Uppsala University. Um, I'm here with my colleague Anne, and we run a course on, uh, it's called Perspectives on Climate Change, eco Psychology, Art and Narratives. So my question is about the crossover between educational policy and cultural policy. It sounds like some of you like work with schools and that kind of thing. So I was wondering if you could expand on the role of education and how uh, culture can, can, or how we can change culture through education and how education can change culture and all of those wonderful tangled messes. Um, and any practical examples that you have would also be really interesting to hear. Thank you. Who'd like to answer that? Here we go. Yeah, I'll start on that one at least. I work for Kultur Tonkin and we are actually directly under the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Education. And in Norway, uh, we got a new curricula uh, where sustainability was one of three overarching themes uh, in 2020. So it has recently started to become in, in, uh, implemented. And uh, that new curricula opens up a new space to work with sustainability across different subjects in schools, that's one thing, but also the ways of working with it offers much more space to the artistic subjects in schools. As, and art as a, yeah, as a knowledge field in itself, but also art as a process or as a means to learn about and connect with the other subjects. So really this consciousness that we are not only learning from our brains, but also with our hearts, and the gut brain and the hands and with everything that we are, to have like a sensuous and poetic and urgent way of learning. I think that's something that has entered our school system now. And the teachers, they're kind of struggling with how to do it, but they really want to do it. And so one concrete example uh, on that is that I'm in the board of this Nordic project by the Nordic Council of Ministers. And there are six different sectors working together, and the cultural sector and the educational sector is one of them. Uh, so there are now, um, and we are now setting up sustainability lab uh, across the Nordic countries where climate engaged artists will meet with um, researchers and teacher students from the University of Oslo um, and other uh, climate experts like climate psychologists and other people that see change, experts on transformational theory, and kind of bring those forces together to channelize their artistic engagement and adapt it in one way into schools, into the becoming as a resource for the teachers in the schools. So that's something that we are planning right now. Hopefully it will be like a pilot in 2023. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in getting updates, I can send you. <laughs> Just come to me afterwards. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Did you want to respond? No, I'm just going to follow up and say, as a part of this project that Sova just uh, elaborated on, we are also doing a green roadmap for the uh, 
cultural institutions of the Nordics. And I'm looking at Lisa now because it sounds like we're doing more or less uh, something similar. And we also did this green roadmap for the Norwegian culture and art sector, uh, which was launched in 2021. So I think it's like about time to connect with the, across the Nordic borders to, mm -hmm. to adapt to exactly what Sora just elaborated on and also about this topic. Yeah, of course. Just a short one, not directly connected to the link between culture and education, but as a general comment upon the link of, like the, the task of linking policy across different ministries. That's extremely complicated. <laughs> we are lucky because we have like the Ministry of Culture as the mother and the, the other as our father. But if you're trying to link, if you're trying to link the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Foreign Policy and the Ministry of Envir the Environment, and well, like they have different ways of working, different ways of kind of establishing yeah. the framework, budgets, everything. So it's extremely complicated. But we are we are on the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can promise you that. But it's. But that's also an answer to your question of why it's taking long. It's not a lack of uh, will. Uh, it's a lack of daring to throw yourself into it. Because the code of contact as a yeah. bureaucrat is that you're, you are very thorough with your things. You know how to do things and you know you con you're a continuation of your own system somehow. And breaking that habit it's very unconventional yeah, and something that you shouldn't do, but that's what we need to do. So, but we need to do it in a careful way um, to maintain continuity at the same time as we break it so that we don't move straight to the, into the yeah. instruction. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
what might happen today as well. I hear all your enthusiasm and all your brilliant ideas. And I uh, must say, I'm sorry, but this will not help. The change must be all of us together. We must be the change. We can't say that someone else will be doing the change. Uh, the politicians, they just want to be re-elected. They don't care about other things than that, because that's their work. The industry that will finance everything, they need the economic growth. They need more technology technology and better solutions, but they, that will not change the world. So maybe I sound too bitter, but uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm really enthusiastic, and I'm really enthusiastic to be here today. Thank you all. Well, thank you. Well, thanks for the pep talk. <laughs> Yeah, no, so as you kind of figured, probably since I'm suing the government, uh, I don't really have that much hope for the established institutions. And um, maybe you tried a lot of things in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, but it seems like, yeah, a lot of you guys went to work. And um, I think that there are a lot of new things that actually hasn't been tried in the past. Like suing governments, for example. That's a really good example. Um, and also the fact that we're so close right now to a climate breakdown that we actually have another position right now. And, and this is, I mean, I, I meet a lot of people on the streets working for Greenpeace, and almost everyone says that, you know, it has to be really, really ba bad until like, people will realize, and it can start getting better again. And I, I mean, so many people are saying that, they might be right. Like, maybe we have to face a real existential crisis. I don't think that the communication reached people before. Uh, not in an engaging enough way, at least. So, I do think that we have another toolbox on the table right now. And uh, also, I don't see any way that this movement is dying right now, because it's gone so bad. Um, and uh, I can promise you that I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> So we're really near the end, and I have the huge privilege of being having the last word. And the last word really is something that we talked about a lot on the Creative Climate Leadership Programme, which is that we are, as we know, we're on the edge of a precipice. We have uh, opportunities to lean in or to turn away. And one of the things that's important to surface is how much is actually happening. We have a, we obviously we've got huge, um, huge obstacles. And you're right, the last 40, 50 years, which is a very short, it's a snifter of a time in the time of, the, of this planet. We've done things catastrophically badly during that very brief time. But there were times before that and before that and before that where we weren't, we weren't on this path to self-destruction. And I think we talked about this a lot during the Climate Leadership Programme, because this is a very difficult place to inhabit, and I'm very appreciative and grateful to everybody in this room now for showing up for this most important conversation. But things change really fast. They can change well, or they can change not so well. And that is down to us. Every single breath that we take is down to us. Every time we opt in, it's down to us. We all know this. And we have everything to play for. Your point about um, the time is, I think you're right. I think this is different from any other moment in history. It's different. And what a privilege to be part of this moment. Wow, that is such a privilege. 
It's such a privilege. We are honoured. We are honoured. And we need to take that honour into everything that we do because there will never be another moment like this. And I think that is a point of both joy and grief and hope and the biggest invitation to be creative with happiness and hope that any of us will ever have. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you and all of you here online and, um, and in the room and also everywhere else. And I have some very specific thank you, thank you. Before we go, I just want to um, thank Vilma, Alf, the chef, who has looked after us so well uh, over the last three days, and the amazing team behind um, all our comfort. You've nourished us all here in Sigtuna, and um, it's been an absolute privilege, and we're very, very grateful. I'd like to thank Jessica and the, the Swedish Postcode Foundation. I'm not, I'm sorry, I didn't. Um, Stiftelsen, that, that's the word, isn't it? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but thank you, Jessica, for your solidarity all the way through from that phone call that we had maybe four, three or four years ago, and you just pitched in and made it happen despite COVID. And what, look at what you have birthed. Great. It's so great. Thank you. And it's just the beginning, all of these amazing people. Sorry, in regards to what Ilva said before too, that if you, why do you not get a requirement uh, in the regeringsbrev, whatever that's called in English, um, from the government stating that this is something that you need to do, have you, I'm asking you all to sort of put pressure on the funders, uh, us as private funders, but also the public funders. You should, you should put the pressure. It's, there are a lot of you now. <laughs> there are a lot of, of um, artists and cultural organizations that uh, are wanting to do stuff. And uh, you know what you need. And you should, you should tell us. Yes. Do that. Here, here. here. Thank you, Jessica. Um, just for today, this amazing crew, Sophie, Matilda, Alex, Sarah, Ingrid, and anybody I've missed out, I'm sorry if I've missed out, you have been awesome, really brilliant. Of course, all the speakers, all of you, um, all of you who have joined us, um, you have given us such a lot of to think about, to mull over, to be challenged by. Um, I would also like to make a special thank you to Diego. <laughs> if you ever want a good partner, work with him. Um, uh, to um, Chiara, who many of you will know. And to, of course, Sharice. constantly delicious to work with but of course um, and I also want to thank the empty chair thank you empty chair for being there all the way through we are speaking to her um, all the time and finally and most importantly I want to thank you amazing creative climate leaders you will and continue to change the world and we've been honoured to work with you all thank you very much